Hello, hello. Thank you so much for tuning into this true crime ASMR soft spoken video. Today we're going to be doing a disappearance case. This case does involve um, like a, a younger girl and possible abuse. So this feels like it doesn't really match where you're at, then that's totally okay. Do what you need to take care of yourself. It's just a little bit of a warning about the contents of this case. So we're going to get into it now, and we're talking about the disappearance case of Lee Ochi. Lee Marine Ochi was born August 21st, 1979, in Honolulu, Hawaii, to Donald Ochi and Vicki Felton. Both were members of the United States Army, and they had met while serving in California. They went on to get married in 1977, and eventually divorced in 1981. Donald Ochi relocated to Germany, but remained in contact with his daughter, who would visit him in Germany. Lee resided in the United States with her mother, and they eventually settled in Tuplio, Mississippi. So Tuplio is a very small town, typical safe area where no one would lock their doors at night, and everyone kind of knew of everyone who lived there. So growing up, Lee was known for being kind, outgoing, smart and a sweet girl who was known for her love of animals and pizza. She was particularly fond of horses and had shown interest in horseback riding. She was known to be a good student, particularly when it came to math, but it was said that she exhibited what others called disruptive behaviors, such as fidgeting and like making um, a little bit of like movements and outbursts, which would result in other kids avoiding her at school. In August of 1992, the city of Tuplio is preparing for Hurricane Andrew. It's category five and it's this terrible, huge hurricane. It begins losing its force as it starts heading towards Mississippi so it gets downgraded from a hurricane to a tropical storm, thankfully. But there is still very high winds and heavy rains coming in. Lee had turned 13 less than a week prior. She was very scared of storms. She even sleeps in the room with her mother because she is so freaked out. So at this time, it's still summer, so school wasn't going to start until the following week. So on August 27th, 1992, Lee is allowed to stay home alone while her mother goes to work around 7.40 in the morning. She has plans later that day to go to the open house at the middle school with her grandparents, and then they have plans to go to dinner to Taco Bell. So it's about an hour into work, and her mother hears of tornado watches in the area and decides to check in on Lee, especially because she's very scared of these storms. She calls the house around 8.30 in the morning to see if she's okay. They had actually set up this little program, um, like a special ring pattern, so Lee would know it's her mom calling from the house phone. Lee does not pick up, so she continues to call over and over, and still no answers. Something doesn't feel right, and she immediately is alarmed. She leaves work to go and drives home because she feels like something is off. Now this drive from her work to her home is about a mile and a half. She pulls up to the home, and she realizes that something is very long, wrong. 
the garage door is wide open. The light inside the garage is still on, and that is very strange because the light doesn't turn on unless someone triggers the door. And the door into the home from the garage is unlocked. Vicky goes inside and begins calling for Lee. As she enters the home, she sees blood on the floor and splattered on the hallway walls. She begins running throughout the home, looking for her daughter everywhere, and is still not able to locate her. Around 9 a.m., she calls 911 to report her missing. Now, the police arrive almost immediately and take this very seriously right away due to how rare it is to have a child missing in this area. The detectives who arrive immediately notice that the home is not messed up and there is no sign of forced entry. Police find blood on the carpet outside of Lee's bedroom that is still wet. They also find blood splatter and hair strands on a door frame. In the main bathroom, there is a pink substance smeared on the countertop, possibly an attempt to clean up. There is also a pair of scissors stained with what looks like blood found on top of the fridge. There is a trail of blood going from the hallway through the living room and towards the back door. Vicky tells police that the doors were locked when she left for work. When, Licky, when Vicky leads them into her bedroom, they discover Lee's shoes, a pair of shorts, and a new pair of underwear she'd received for her birthday. Her glasses and a sleeping bag were missing from the home. A bloodied nightgown was tossed in the clothes hamper. Investigators studied the nightgown and concluded that the blood likely came from a neck or head wound, as it looked like it had been dripped onto the gown from above. A team of bloodhounds searched the neighborhood, running through nearby fields and ditches. As they picked up no trace of young Lee, it was hard to tell if the heavy rains were washing away any scent of the girl or if there was simply none to be found in the area. As they continue processing evidence, they realize the scissors on top of the fridge were actually not blood but rust. But since but still, with all the blood at the scene, it indicates a serious crime had occurred. Tests later revealed that the blood in the home was type O, Lee's blood type. But since it's 1997, all they can determine is that it's most likely Lee's blood due to the same blood type, and that this blood had come from the same person. As the search continues, Lee's father, Donald, soon secured leave from his army post in Alexandria, Victoria, and joined the search efforts. There were tons of volunteers, helicopters, dogs, horses, to search 80 acres around the home. A shocking development then occurs 13 days after she disappeared on September 9th. Her mother receives a strange package in the mail, and it contains Lee's missing reading glasses. It was sent in an envelope that was addressed to B. Yarborough, with the home street address misspelled. There was nothing else inside of this envelope. So Barney Yarborough is Lee's stepfather. Her mother and him had separated recently, and he hadn't lived with them for over a month. After this development, the FBI became involved in the search for her, and they performed a DNA test on the stamps that were on the envelope, and it was determined that they had been put on with water rather than saliva. 
There was also six stamps on this envelope, which is kind of a lot. I guess this person really wanted to make sure it got there. Lee's mother, Vicky, is taking this as a sign of hope, however. She is thinking that this may mean that her daughter is still alive, and so she goes to the media and thanks whoever sent them. But the police are not sure. They end up tracing the package postmark to a town called Boonville, Mississippi, which is about a half an hour away from Tuplio. This actually connects to a lead that police received previously on September 4th, 1992, which was eight days after Lee went missing. A worker at McDonald's in Boonville told law enforcement that they had seen a girl resembling Lee in a blue pickup truck in the restaurant drive through Police were able to track down this vehicle and the child and determined it was not Lee. So this ends up being a dead end, but now police are stuck without any additional information or DNA. Police in town begin to suspect that maybe these glasses were sent to thrown off the investigation and many begin to suspect Vicky. They think she's been too calm during the start of this investigation and acting opposite to what she should be. But it's important to note that she was in the military and was trained to act calm in situations. Her father, Donald, says that Vicky initially told him that she had run away from home and did not tell him of the blood in the home that was found until a week later. He also states that while searching for his daughter, in September of 1992, he was told by several locals to, quote, look at the mother. However, he commented, I was already doing that, and I don't know if her mother was involved. Donald also states that Vicky was keeping Lee away from him and limiting contact, perhaps due to concern that Lee would tell him too much. But he never states what those things are. It's also good to kind of note that there may have been some animosity towards Vicky just because of the divorce and the separation. There were also rumors beginning that Barney, her stepfather, aunt, or her mother were possibly abusing Lee. She had allegedly shown up to school with bruises and a black eye to which she said she got kicked by a horse. She did ride horses, but this was still a very notable injury. Classmates remember that Lee had previously shown up to school covered in bruises, though she attributed them to horseback riding. One of Lee's friends recalled that she once seen her eating berries at the school playground and warned her that they may be poisonous just for fun like kids do. I think it's funny to do that. Lee responded that she didn't care and that maybe she wanted to die. But she later said she was joking, but this comment still stuck with her friend. There were incidents where she would state being afraid of her mom and stepdad and did not want to go home. One time at summer camp, she was so distraught about going back home, the camp had to call in counselors to help calm her down. Neighbors stated Barney locked her out of the home as a form of punishment. So there was nothing official indicating that CPS was involved, but it was the 90s, so it may not have been utilized as it would today. There's also this point I was thinking about of like the connection of her behaviors being described as being disruptive and fidgeting as maybe a sign of emotional distress or abuse. Police begin hearing about these accusations and look further into Vicky. They look at the timeline of events that she had provided the morning of the disappearance. So overall the timeline is that she left at 7.40 that morning, 
arrives at work and then is back at home at 8.30 and calling 911 by 9 a.m. So her work was located close to the home and this would mean that the time period would indicate that someone would have entered the home, injured or killed Lee, attempted to clean up and abducted her all before Vicky arrived. Vicky actually ends up telling police a little bit of multiple stories for her morning that day. At some point, she says that she calls 911 as soon as she got home, but in another version, she tells police she actually called her mother before calling 911. So in this version, there's about 15 to 20 minutes of unaccounted time from when Vicky arrives home and when she calls 911. To me, this, I could see calling your mom who had plans with your daughter later in the day and just checking in to make sure, but then again, if you walk into the site of blood, I don't know if you'd assume that somebody just had her casually. Police are not even sure that Lee was alive that morning and can only really go by what Vicky had reported since no one else had seen her that day. Vicky takes three polygraph tests at three different times. One was administered by a local polygraph examiner and the other two by the FBI. She failed it three times. Vicky defended herself against the polygraph results, saying, quote, I couldn't tell you why. They measure changes in the body, and when your daughter has gone missing and they strap you up to those things, I can't imagine anyone's body not reacting, which is fair. Polygraph tests aren't completely reliable, in my opinion. I think most people feel that too, but... Barney Yarborough, the stepfather, was ruled out by law enforcement. However, he provided a alibi and he passed a polygraph on November 5th, 1993. A 18-year-old man is on his farm in northwest Monroe County, Mississippi. He is in a soybean field when he discovers a human skull. Days later, a Monroe County coroner says using dental records they were able to match the remains to Lee. Several days later, however, the identification was retracted. And in this retraction, it is stated that the medical examiner would perform few future further forensic testing on the skull. It is determined that the skull belonged to a 27-year-old, Sue Keith, a woman who had gone missing in March 1993. So mixing up a 13-year-old and a 27-year-old and like reporting that before being sure, I think someone got Investigators announced in August 1997 that they had a suspect in the case, but declined to publicly name them. Years later, a new search of Lee's former backyard was conducted. As it was revealed that the public work office had been installing rocks as a form of drainage control at the time of her disappearance, this led to the possible belief that she could have accidentally been buried by those working on the site, which was disproven by the use of cadaver dogs who failed to pick up her scent. Despite many searches, her remains have never been found, and there have been no leads that indicated about her whereabouts, and no one has been arrested in this case. So here's some of the theories. So the first one is talking about the glasses being sent. And that is kind of the most interesting part of this case. And there's some theories around the misspelling of the address. That either the person who had sent them did not know the area or family well. Or that it had been intentionally misspelled to draw attention away from anyone close. 
Many believe, due to the allegations of abuse and Lee's feelings towards home, that Vicky played a role in her daughter's disappearance. Despite the fact that Vicky was never charged in connection to disappearance, Donald, her Lee's dad, still believes that maybe she knows something. He does this interview um, with Anthony Wayne where he explains that Vicky was a trained interrogator for the U.S. Army. He says, quote, I had my concerns. I don't think they had dealt with someone with Vicky's intelligence before. She was a trained interrogator and she knew how to act regarding questioning. He doesn't believe there would be enough time for someone to come into the house, kill Lee, hide weapons, clean up in the bed, uh, the blood in the bathroom in less than an hour. So his theory is that she killed Lee the night before and then lied to the law enforcement about the entire timeline. And that maybe like while she was at work, she was very antsy and anticipating, you know, going about this story about her daughter, so she just kind of immediately did it, and maybe didn't think about the timing that she left. The other theory in this case is that Barney is responsible for her disappearance, with the rumors spreading that he allegedly had this violent behavior towards her, and there's like a friend of the family who claimed that they had heard that Barney had hit and whipped Lee. Donald also once says to police that Barney had confessed to abusing Lee, but the detectives working in the case said they never found any evidence that the abuse occur occurred, so many questioned who Donald had spoken to. Vicky had also added that Lee never expressed any alleged fear of Barney to her. So this next theory is one that Lee's mother believes. Vicky indicates that Oscar Kearns, the Sunday school teacher at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church that they attended, may have been involved. He lived only about a mile away from the home. He also had horses at the same stable that Lee frequented, and he often asked young girls to go riding with him. And it seems like he may have asked Lee once or twice to go riding with him as well. Lee argued that since there were no signs of for forced entry, Lee must have opened the door for whoever abducted her. And since she never would have let in a stranger, the perpetrator would have to have been someone she knew. She says Oscar acted very strange after the disappearance and would not look her in the eye. He also apparently had brought a picture of Lee after her disappearance over to the house and tries to give it to Vicky. Then just nine months after Lee went missing, Oscar Kearns abducted a 15-year-old in Memphis, Tennessee, whom he'd met through church. He sexually assaulted her before dropping her off at school, and he pleaded guilty to rape. Oscar was sentenced to eight years in prison, but he only served four, and was released in 1997. Then two years later, he kidnapped a married couple and raped the wife. He served an additional 20 years for those crimes. Oscar Kearns has continuously refused to speak with police and the FBI about Lee's disappearance. He died in May of 2021 without giving any information regarding Lee's case. Oscar actually had some rumors about Lee's disappearance as well. He kind of starts to tell people that maybe she was buried in a barn, another time stating that she was buried in the church basement, which did have open construction during Hurricane Andrew. 
So I saw some indications that police maybe did search this barn area and found nothing connecting to the case. So Vicky and Barney eventually divorce. A couple years after Lee went missing, Barney passed away in 1996 and Vicky moved to Michigan as her parents had relocated there. She hopes her daughter is still alive and copes by remembering the good times they had together. Donald since had re has remarried and started a family and he hopes that she died the same day she disappeared so that she didn't suffer. He wants the perpetrator to be found and prosecuted for what they did. He shares that he had written a book of advice for Lee which he planned to give her on one of her birthdays and is really sad he was never able to give it to her. Currently, her case is classified as an endangered, missing, and foul play is strongly suspected. If alive, she would be 42 years old today. Those with information regarding the case can contact Tuplio Police Department at 662-841-6491 or the FBI at 202-324-3000. Tips can also be submitted anonymous, anonymously through Crime Stoppers of Northeast Mississippi at 1-800-773-8477. So that is the disappearance case of Lee O.G. This one is one of those that really leaves a lot of you could kind of take these theories, each theory, and run with it. You know, the idea of the short timeline and her mom and just the abuse and, you know, all these things is very interesting and suspicious. But then, you know, this guy, Oscar, I mean, he clearly has engaged in those similar crimes, so to think that he wouldn't be involved, I think is not a possibility that we can rule out. It's just so sad because there's answers somewhere, and it requires someone to say something for anyone to get these answers. Let me know what you guys think about this one. Um, it's so sad trying to figure out where the angles kind of go. Um, so thank you so much for watching. I um, hope you're having a good day or night wherever you are and you have a good day tomorrow. And I will see you in my next one.